Now tonight, we are here for a very special evening with author Eleanor Gordon-Smith. Eleanor is a philosopher, writer, and radio broadcaster working at the intersection of academic ethics and the chaos of human life. Currently at Princeton University, she has produced The Philosopher's Zone on Australia's Radio National, appeared as the clinical ethicist on 702 Sydney Radio, and lectured on ethics from political contract theory to the philosophy of sex at the University of Sydney. Her work has appeared on NPR's This American Life and in the Sydney Morning Herald, The Australian, among many other outlets. We are here tonight for her first book, Stop Being Reasonable, How We Really Change Our Minds. In the book, Gordon Smith weaves a narrative that illustrates the limits of human reason and how persuasion is possible. I'll read you the one blurb uh, that I enjoyed um, uh, from none other than Ira Glass from This American Life. He says, I know how piercingly smart Eleanor Gordon Smith is and what a curious and resolute interviewer but I was unprepared for how entertainingly she writes. I read this with pleasure. Without further ado, please join me in giving Eleanor Gordon-Smith a warm Harrisburg welcome. Thank you so much. It's always embarrassing to have to adjust this for those of us who are five feet, but there we go. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. Um, so, in the brief time that we have together, I thought I would tell you a little about the origin of this book, about why I started working on it, the shape that it took, um, and then some of the contents that I hope will persuade you to buy it, uh, and more importantly, I think, the kind of lesson that it left me with about how persuasion works and how we can salvage some sense of optimism in the current climate, which is one in which I think I'm not alone in feeling kind of pessimistic and a little at sea about quite how persuasion is meant to get traction in the way that we anticipated that it would. So as you heard in the very kind introduction, this is a book which is about persuasion. It's a book which is about the limits of human reason. More precisely, it's a series of true stories about people who change their minds in a series of very high stakes situations. So each chapter is a true story based on interviews that I did with someone over the course of like six months to two years about some change in their belief system that for them represented like a massive upheaval. So we're talking about the kinds of shifts in belief that represented a sort of trauma for people to have to let go of. The kinds of things where after you change your mind, there's a period of chaos and confusion where it's not quite clear what means what or who to trust or which sense of self to salvage from the wreckage. And I wanted to do these interviews with people to try to find out a little more about what persuasion looks like when it goes right, or more importantly, about what mind changing really looks like when it happens for real people in the real world, instead of on TV and a kind of sanitized political debate in the way that a lot of us have come to expect. So it's a series of true stories about people who change their mind. But as well as being that, it's a kind of series of meditations about quite what rationality and logic and reasonableness in fact demand of us. So the title's a little misleading. It's called Stop Being Reasonable. It's because Stop Making Sense was taken. Um, but it's not, qu it's not quite accurate. It's not an entreaty to stop being reasonable. It's not a demand to stop being rational. It's rather through the lens of each one of these stories, an invitation to come to a more capacious account of quite what we mean by being reasonable, to try to bring back into our conception of rationality and logic a little more of the human, a little more of the emotional, a little more of the self, and the kinds of intimate personal details that we very often forget have a role in changing people's minds. So that's the pamphlet version. That's what I'm gonna to try to talk to you a little bit about in the time that follows. So I want to tell you about how it started. I want to tell you about my particular interest in this, this topic and why it started to feel very urgent for me. And then I want to tell you about some of the stories that are in the book and give you a quick overview of what I think are the most interesting and exciting examples in this book of people really changing their minds. And then I want to tell you a little about what I think that leaves us with and what kind of lessons we can draw out of these particular stories. So let's start with why I'm interested in this personally. I was, uh, I don't know if it shows, an only child. Um, and I was also very interested in high school debate. I spent an awful lot of my life growing up as a young person speaking on stage to people in what I thought was a persuasive way. So I spent huge amounts of time with a timer in front of me wearing a blazer, anticipating a punitive bell from someone at the eight minute mark, learning strategies of rhetoric from Aristotle and from the great speeches and reading transcripts of the most persuasive speeches in history. And I thought that I had this skill kind of down pat because I won a lot of trophies for it, which is a very good way to convince a 16 year old that they don't need to learn anything anymore. Um, 
And I debated a huge amount. I debated for 25 hours a week at one point when I was 16. I entered the Australia, you can hear my accent, I'm from Australia. I entered the Australian National Debating Championships and then we went to the World Debating Championships and then we competed in Paris and Qatar and in Doha and in Saudi Arabia and in South Korea and in Botswana. It's a very peculiar life where you just fly all over the world pretending that you have opinions on geopolitics and convincing yourself that you're really persuasive. So I was, when I left school and sort of left university, quite convinced that I particularly was a good bastion of persuasion and that I understood how rational argument was meant to work. After all, if you train in something for that long, then you should be really good at it. In fact, it turns out, you'll be astonished to hear, that I was very bad at changing people's minds in actual personal situations. And the way that I discovered this has to do with, uh, with our dear friend Ira Glass. Hands up if people know the radio program This American Life. Okay, broadly, good. Uh, it's a radio program which has one of the largest audiences in America, and by sheer coincidence, I interviewed its host, Ira Glass, when he came to Australia, and uh, he sent me an email a couple of days later saying, are you working on anything that might be good for the radio show? And I wasn't, but you don't reply to that email by saying, dear Ira, no, thank you. <laughs> um, so I said to him, look, I have this idea that I've been kicking around for a while. Why don't I take a microphone and a recorder out onto the streets of Sydney, out into the party districts of Sydney, and just wait to be catcalled. Why don't I just wait to see what kind of street harassment type remarks get leveled at me? And instead of just doing the ordinary thing of walking past and pretending that it didn't happen, why don't I take some of this persuasive prowess that I think I have and turn around and say to them, what did you say, why did you say it, and what would it take for me to persuade you that this is not only a really noxious thing to do, but something which is actively undermining the women that you do it to? And he was like, great, go do it. Sounds cool, we'll come, you know, we'll talk in a month once you've got the tape. So I went out with the assistance of one of the producers at This American Life, and I spent close to six weeks going out every night at 9 p.m. and coming home at somewhere in the vicinity of two or three in the morning. I would in that time be shouted at by a whole litany of men, they would whistle, they would yell compliments, they would yell insults, the whole thing that we're all familiar with. And over and over again, I would say to them, why did you do that? What were you hoping for? And how could I persuade you to give this up? And you'll be amazed to hear, although I genuinely was kind of amazed by this, that I was not in the course of any one of these conversations able to affect a moment of sincere reckoning with what they were doing in a way that was personal or felt real. Instead, what happened over and over again was that we would reach this moment where I would say, women don't enjoy this, and they would say, well, you can't speak for all women, and I have better access to the truth about this than you do. Thanks for your time, have a good night. And this went on and on and on and on, and the time difference between Australia and America was at the time very bad because of daylight savings, so I would get home at sort of two or three in the morning. At five, I would be up to do the edits with the team at This American Life. I was fraying personally, emotionally, physically, it was turning out to be a much more difficult assignment than I had imagined. And there was this one night, one Saturday night, where I felt like I just couldn't do it anymore. I felt like I could not stomach one more interaction where I failed to change someone's mind. And I said that. I said to Ira and to Neil, like, I just can't go out tonight. I'm too tired. I know you want me to. I've had enough. I'm fed up. I'm not doing it. And to their eternal credit, they said, that's exactly why you need to go out tonight. It is this tiredness and this frustration that will turn out to be useful persuasive currency. So I did. And it was that night that I met a man who went on to be the backbone for the episode that we eventually put to air, a man named Zach, who told me that his kind of primary strategy for picking up women in the street was to smack them on what he called their bums, um, just like Australian for us, I don't know, um, and to yell at them and to otherwise kind of be raucous and rambunctious with them. And I spoke to him for close to two hours that night in an alleyway with his friend. And then I got his phone number and I asked him to invite me to, to come back to talk to me sort of just personally, privately, one-on-one. -on -one. And I spoke to him for another hour alone in a gutter at like 5 p.m. on a weekday. And after three hours of conversation with this guy, I managed to get him to see that actually striking women, that actually hitting them was not ideal. But that was it. That was the extent of what he would give up. And we had this long, intimate, personal, honest, touching conversation about why he thought what he thought and why I thought what I thought. And I could not get him to move. The reason that this kind of puts me in a position to be interested about persuasion is 
on one level, just obvious, right? Which is that I thought I was good at persuasion and it turned out that I wasn't. But the more interesting thing was that then when the episode went to air, I was inundated with hundreds of interview requests and thousands, literally thousands of emails. Someone asked me if I'd accept an award for the successful use of rational persuasion in public. People were kind of treating me with the credit and the success that you would give to someone who had in fact succeeded in changing people's minds, oblivious to the fact that all of my strategy and all of my reasoning had not in fact worked. And it was this bizarre inkblot moment where I felt like I was looking at these conversations I'd had where over and over again, I failed to change anyone's minds. And audiences and people around the world were listening to the same conversations, the, the literal actual tape of those conversations and seeing instead instances of a persuasive success. And it made me realize that very often we are so hasty to congratulate ourselves for being what we think of as rational that we forget to ask whether or not it's in fact working. And then a publisher came to me and said, do you want to write a book which is a, a 10 step guide to how to change people's minds? Uh, and I said, I cannot in good conscience produce that book and anyone who tells you that they can is I a, a, like a liar or, or is grievously mistaken. But I said, look, what I can do is produce the book that I, that I want to produce, which is to take the failure that I felt, the sense of loss that I felt, and the sense of disillusionment that I felt about our chances at being able to reach each other, and tried to pull some optimism out of that. And instead said, why don't I look at stories where people have actually managed to change their minds, stories where it didn't end the way that it ended for me in Sydney and King's Cross in the party district, just with this kind of stalemate that doesn't go anywhere. Let me tell the stories about how it goes right. Um, and so I'm gonna to read to you a little bit from the introduction, which kind of, I hope, captures some of the mission of the book. Here's my point. In our haste to congratulate ourselves for being reasonable, we accidentally untied the very notion of rationality from its rich philosophical ancestry and from the complexity of actual human minds. And now the idea of being reasonable that underpins our public discourse has little to do with helping us find our way back to the truth or to each other, and altogether more to do with an anesthetized dream of an optimized future where everything is protein powder and nothing hurts. The strange thing is that most of us are already suspicious of this image of rational debate. How many times have you seen a TV panel discussion in which the defender of one view turned to their opponent and said, you know, actually, that's a pretty good point, ever? And when you changed your mind about something close to you, was it because of a rational argument or was the process something stranger and more difficult to map, like a subterranean rumble that you weren't aware of until it was over or a single moment in which the old facts cast a new shadow? Most of us learned long ago that changing our minds about something that matters, like whether we were right to act the way we did, whether to believe what we're being told or whether we're in love is far messier than any topiaried argument will allow because those spaces aren't debates. They're moments between people, messy, flawed, baggage carrying people and our words have to navigate a space where old hurts and concealed fears and calcified beliefs hang stretched between us like spun sugar, catching the light for only a second or two before floating out of view again. In that space, reason and logic don't work the way that we're trained to think they will. Language doesn't even work. Where once stood your helpful little army of words marshalling themselves into formations that express yourself and your point, there now stands a, ro a mob of rogue mercenaries inflicting damage in ways that you can't even understand, let alone apologize for. Wittgenstein once said that if a lion could speak, we wouldn't understand him. Sometimes I think it's not just lions. So why, when we know that changing our minds is as tangled and difficult and messy as we are, do we stay so wedded to the thought that rational debate is the best way to go about it? Why do we hold our ideal of rationality fixed and try to mold ourselves around it instead of the other way around? Why do we still think that the important question is a psychological one about how we do change our minds instead of a philosophical one about how we should? So that's kind of the mission. I now want to tell you uh, like two of, of the stories that I think stand out to me as particularly vivid illustrations of kind of what the book's about. Just as a quick overview, the six stories are as follows. There's one story, which is the, the completion of that catcalling story and about how it made me change my mind. There's a story about uh, a woman who has to reckon with whether or not her own memory of being abused as a child is accurate. There's a woman who finds out that her husband has been harboring a criminal secret from her and she has to kind of reckon with what that realization tells her about herself as much as about him. There's a man who finds out that his family is not in fact his family 
Uh, there's a man who leaves a cult after having been raised in it for 26 years. And there's a man who changes his mind about who he really is, what his actual identity is. Uh, and it's those last two that I want to tell you a little bit about tonight. So I'll start with the kind of less funny one and I'll end on the funnier one. There are moments of levity throughout the book. I promise it's not just an exercise in seriousness. Um, so the man who left the cult after being raised in it for 25 years, his name's Dylan. His wife's name is Missy. And the short version of what happened to them is that they fell in love. And this kind of irritated Missy insofar as she really hadn't had a plan to end up with a member of a cult. It was really not in her vision of how her life was going to end up, that she was going to be married to someone with this strong set of religious beliefs. And nonetheless, she met Dylan while they were both working in a restaurant and she fell so in love with him and is still so in love with him that interviewing them is kind of a problem. Like as a reporter, it's really difficult to get them to understand that sentences are not collaborative exercises because they just talk in this endless jigsaw of each other's words. It's very frustrating. Um, so Missy and Dylan were like an instant unit. The problem is that Missy didn't believe what the cult believed. She never believed what the cult believed, but he did. So she did something which is in its own way a more profound exercise of faith than anything he ever did, which is that she married him anyway, and she had children with him anyway, and she went to live with him inside the sect and pretended for seven years that she believed what they did. She pretended to him, to his family, to the elders around them, that she was open to being baptized, that this was kind of also something that she was figuring out in her own time, and all along, her plan was to sow seeds of doubt in his mind and to eventually crack him out of this cult and to help him be the man that she thought he could be once he was free of this cult. It's a very high risk strategy, right? Right? Um, so, I mean, Missy is really matter of fact when she talks about this, but I think it's an astonishing exercise of courage um, or foolishness, you know? Um, Aristotle said that virtue is somewhere between the two. Um, so what in fact happened was that Missy's plan didn't work the way that she thought it would. In fact, it wound up being a really profound moment where Dylan was called on by an elder for reasons that I'll leave concealed because they're in the book, called on by an elder to choose between his salvation and his wife. And he realized that he trusted his wife more than he trusted the elders around him. And for me, that leads to a really profound meditation about the fact that it is very often who we believe and not what we believe that plays an important role in crowbarring us into certain beliefs. The other thing to know about this book and about me is that in my day job, I'm an academic philosopher. I'm currently at Princeton, which is one of the most analytic philosophy schools that's ever done analytic philosophy. And what I try to do with each one of these stories is to reveal a kind of philosophical point about what being reasonable actually means. And in this story, the philosophical point that I want us to come away with is that very often it's rational to trust people and it's rational to believe things on faith when they are the kinds of things that our loved ones tell us. Not always, but very often. And I think that that gives us an insight into the way that we can use the fact that it is who we believe and not just what we believe to kind of shepherd people towards the truth in a way that we might often forget we're allowed to do. The second story that I want to tell you a little bit about is this guy named Alex. And Alex changed his mind about who he really was, which as a philosopher is so delectable to me as a problem because he found himself in this situation where he was trying to change his mind about his personality. But the only thing that you have available for changing your mind is the thing that stands to be changed by the process of changing it, right? He's using his own mind to reason about his mind. And it gets into this amazing like tailspin that philosophically is so much fun to spend time in. The reason that Alex wanted to change his mind about who he really was is very peculiar. And it is in the short version that he went on a reality TV show. And this was way back, like way back, like in 2000, before reality TV was Kardashians and millionaires. This was back when reality TV was basically just psychological experiments that you didn't need ethical approval for. And then producers could just put this stuff on air. They're like, what would happen to a brain if we put a corkscrew in it in the following way? And they just televised the results. So Alex went on this program called Faking It which was a program in the UK, which is basically just My Fair Lady, but contemporary. And the way that the producers organized it was that they took someone of a particularly archetypical identity, and then they gave them six weeks to perfect a skill that was really opposed to that identity. So they took a skinhead and they made him conduct the London Symphonic Orchestra. They took a house painter and they made him put on a conceptual art installation exhibit. 
And they took Alex, who was this elbow patched, punt riding, went to Eton, went to Oxford, went to Cambridge, eldest son of an eldest son, aristocrat type Englishman. The line in the book is that he shows us around the country gardens of his house and introduces us to Roger, who is a horse. Um, and they took this man and they trained him to be a bouncer. <laughs> and he's, a, he's smaller than I am. And they trained him to be a bouncer, not just full stop, but at the biggest club in central London on the final night of the 2000 European Football Championships. <laughs> This is like a very high risk strategy. I don't know what the insurance was for this. Um, and I'll conceal whether he was successful. It's a fantastic story. But what happened to him as a result of this experience was that he got on the train to go back to his old house and his old family and back to Roger the horse. And he realized that he wasn't sure whether he'd been faking the bouncer identity or the original identity. He was no longer sure which of them was the act. And he wound up in this amazing existential nosedive where I think he teaches us something fascinating about the limits of reason. Insofar as the challenge that he faced was, what do I make of the evidence in front of me? Because he had 22 years of evidence that he was this particular kind of person. But it could be that that evidence was just produced by his belief that he was that kind of person in that there's a strange thing that happens with our beliefs about ourselves, which is that they are capable of authoring their own evidence. So the more we believe that we are this kind of person, the more our actions and behavior will create a kind of forensic deposit of evidence that we are in fact that kind of person. Such that when we ask, what kind of person am I? And we look to our actions and behavior to give us the answer, we'll find the things that we created on the basis of the belief that we are now questioning. This is an astonishing moment of evidentiary confusion and something that could not be higher stakes. The thing that he was trying to change was himself. And the story ends in a desert in Australia uh, where Alex is putting his bouncer skills to use in a very peculiar way. And how those dots join up, I'll conceal. <laughs> but it, it, it pays off. So where does that leave us? Where, where do we wind up after hearing some of these stories? Every one of the stories in this book, I hope, serves as a kind of black light for what rationality and being reasonable in fact demands. I don't have answers about how we can change people's minds about whether they should be a Nazi or a fascist or changing racist people's beliefs over Thanksgiving. I don't know the answers to those questions. They're very difficult questions. What I do have is a set of useful questions and an invitation for us to be more sophisticated, more nuanced, more personal, and more philosophical in the way that we set out to understand the demands of persuasion. I think it's useful for us to ask questions about how persuasion really does work because it might well turn out that we're wrong. And we put vast amounts of energy and time and network sponsorship and broadcast hours into a certain vision of rational debate, which is the one that I had when I was a high school debater. And if it turns out that that way of doing things is not just pragmatically misguided, but sitting on shaky philosophical foundations, then it's well worth our while to reconsider it. I don't think that it's wrong. I think that the promise of liberal democracy is a strong one, and I hope that we're right to imagine that speaking to each other is a way of bringing ourselves closer to the truth. But I think that somewhere along the way, we forgot to inhabit that ideal with humanity, with nuance, with the personal detail that comes from every individual person's reckoning with the beliefs that they need to change. And the second thing that I think that we can get from these stories is a kind of blueprint for our own attempts to change people's minds. And I don't mean that it's wound up being a 10-step guide after all, it hasn't. It's wound up being a set of what I hope are pretty interesting stories and some questions that we ought to think about. But in the most familiar, old-fashioned way, I think that itself can be a kind of blueprint. I think there is a way that when we hear other people's stories of change and upheaval, we recognize in those stories moments of our own change and upheaval and the kinds of change and upheaval that we see in the people around us, or more importantly, that we hope to see. I get hundreds of emails now. This book's been out in Australia and the UK for a little while. And I keep getting emails from people telling me about how stories in the book reminded them of changes of their own or ways that they've been able to put moments of the story to work on people in their life. And the stories have really surprised me. They have been intimate and peculiar and idiosyncratic and really touching. And I hope that each story in this book serves as that kind of oblique blueprint just in the way that we recognize in other people's stories some of our own.
So I want to close by uh, reading to you a little bit about my own feelings after having collected these stories, after having spent two years interviewing people who changed their minds in these ways. So uh, this, this excerpt comes from uh, the, final, the final chapter of stories, which is an interview with this man who discovered that his family was not who he thought they were, that he'd been deceived for upwards of 50 years about who his family is. I call him Peter, that's not his real name, but oh, and since the book, this isn't in the book, because it had to go to press, but since then, because he spoke to me, Peter hired uh, an international investigator and found out the name of his biological father, the person that he didn't think he was gonna be able to meet, and he found his name and he thought, like, this is really beautiful, at least now I know who this guy is, but he was 99 years old, or he would have been, so he thought, like, you know, it's a shame, but now I know who he is. And then, like a week after this thing went to print, he found out that not only is his father still alive, he was living about four feet down the road in Australia, on the other side of the world from where they'd both been born. And then he went to go and visit him, which, by the way, it was kind of complicated, right? Because as a 99-year-old man, you don't want to turn up and be like, hi, I'm your son, and instantly he's had a heart attack and he's dead. Um, so he, but he did go and visit him, and he sent me a photo of them, and it like, makes me cry to think about. Uh, he, he went and visited him, and they both turned up wearing the same outfit. And his dad said, you're pretty handsome, but not as handsome as me. <laughs> anyway, so this is Peter. Towards the end of our conversation, Peter said, laughing, this feels like therapy. In truth, I'd felt that way in a lot of the interviews I'd done for this book. There had been stories of such massive upheavals, moments where the bedrock and everything on top of it started to shake. A revelation like that could destroy you, says Peter. I think I was lucky. My sense of self must have been fairly strong. It had felt intimate to hear stories of these moments to hear the ways that people pressed forward out of chaos without answers to the questions about what to believe and why. I was struck by how varied their paths to truth had been, but how uniformly they looked back on their mind change as something to be proud of instead of as a moment of shame or defeat. I was struck by how often muddy, ordinary things like whom they trusted or what they valued had helped them find the truth and live through its consequences. It had felt personal to hear all these things, like being invited into the secret belfry of someone's mind to peer around at all the ropes. And it made me all the more bitterly disappointed to keep turning on the TV and finding a climate of public argumentation that treats changing minds as combat, or worse, entertainment, by trading on the lucrative fiction that being reasonable is just being really good at arguing. It's a comforting idea, surrounded as we are by so much endemic unreasonableness. But as an account of rationality is both philosophically impoverished and utterly inapplicable to the fragile, intimate moments when we need it most. I look at our public debates now and see an abdication of our intellectual duties to each other and to the nuances of rationality. But more importantly, I see an abdication of our moral duties to each other. I do not know the answers to many of the questions that I've asked in this book. Instead, I think each story is a reminder that rationality itself may turn out to be as tangled, as knotty, and as rooted in reality as the minds it hopes to change. Thank you guys so much. We're gonna open it up to audience Q&A, so you, if you have a, a question, raise your hand, and I'll come around with a mic, and we're gonna start over here. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was all very, very interesting. Um, I'm wondering, when we refer to persuasion, oftentimes it's in the lens, often like with existential crises, of like an individual interaction. It's one person persuading another. Mm -hmm. um, however, when you kind of broaden the lens and bring it to more so like mass social movements yeah. and cultural movements, um, it really strikes me that that spontaneity that you've kind of seemed to be a persistent theme through and through, kind of that the... Um, the structured form of persuasion that we like to think that persuasion yeah. really is, it's oftentimes more spontaneous than that. How do you see your work kind of, um, much like with quantum physics, when you go down to the quantum yeah, level, yeah. everything's bumping around and everything, and it's a lot more spontaneous, but then once you go to the more Newtonian classical yeah. um, model, everything kind of falls into place. How do you see this, that spontaneity kind of functioning once you get to the larger level, for instance, with... Um, changing views of gay marriage over mm. the course of decades and how mm. all age demographics have changed. Um, it's not just this. Um, well, that's, that's a whole other conversation to get into, but how do you kind yeah. of see that fitting into your work? Yeah, what a beautiful question. And, and like how well put, that's a really striking image. 
this was something that I, I wanted to do very self-consciously. It was like a methodological choice. I wanted to get into this like very, very fine grain. And not just the fine grain, but the, I'm gonna mix metaphors, the fine grain and the high stakes, right? So I wanted to have a combination of those two things. Partly because I think it's precisely in those moments that you are forced to interact with the complexity of a story. And you're forced to understand this particular person's mind change as part of their life rather than as a data point in let's say a generation's wide psychological study about how these things work. And I think something that that reveals, for me at least, is that the genealogy of these beliefs is as important as the content themselves. So very often now when people ask me like, so how do, you, how do I change your mind? Like actually materially, what do I do? As I'm sitting at the dinner table, what do I do? The thing that I say now that was apparent to me after I finished working on this and after I worked on the ones that, you know, that didn't wind up in the book um, is that in the individual level, as well as I think at the macro level, so much an important part of what explains why people think they do and more importantly, why they let go of what they ultimately let go of is the causal history of why it arrived there. So very often when like you and I have a debate about let's say gay marriage, the way that we do it is just like, okay, you think A, I think B, let's marshal our respective pools of evidence. Tell me you know, the facts in support of A and you'll come out with a list of evidence and I'll come out with a list of evidence. And what both of us ignore in this charade is that very seldom is a list of evidence that we come out with, in fact, the causal explanation for why we think the thing that we think. And there's a whole other set of questions about like how old were you when you first came to this belief? Who was it who gave it to you? Do your parents think this way? Do your friends think this way? What does it represent to you socially? What does it mean to you as, as a part of who you are? And these kinds of questions about like literally causally, historically, how did you come to have this belief? I think those questions become visible in the micro level in a way that they often disappear at the macro. And so often when we find ourselves with a kind of frustration about like why on this macro level do we keep seeing like confirmation bias or like present focus bias or just these psychological phenomena that we have names for and that we study the broad trends of, the thing that I think goes missing in that is that each one of those data points is an impossibly complicated coalescence of these individual factors which actually have nothing to do with evidence and what philosophers call reasons for belief, right? Yeah. Other, other questions? Yes, over here. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm wondering um, the extent to which you think you could address the kind of crisis in personality that maybe we face as we change our minds. How much can people right. bear at any given moment? And if we want to change the minds of somebody else or ourselves, how do we take that factor into mm. consideration? Mm. Thank you. This is such a, this, what a great question. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is a crisis of personality. Sometimes literally, as in Alex's case, where the thing that you are changing your mind about is who you are. But even when the thing you're changing your mind about is just like, is there a God? Do I love my spouse? You know, these things that feel kind of pedestrian when you say them out loud, insofar as like millions of people have also gone through that change of mind. Nonetheless, it's a huge loss. I mean, it's a kind of trauma, I think. Um, and there is a sort of grieving that has to happen for the life that you thought you had while the thing that you used to think appeared to you as true. So how much can people, there are two parts to your question. The first was how much can people bear and the second was how do we take that into account? How much can people bear? The thing that working on this made vivid to me is I, and I'm like genuinely moved and reassured by this, I think vast amounts. I think much more than we take into account. So like Nicole, for example, who I just did a radio show about for This American Life a, a little while ago. She's a woman who had to come to terms with not really knowing whether her own memory of being abused as a child is accurate. Now, if you think about that with any degree of precision and any degree of like actual inhabiting what that must be like, you take the closest person in your life, for her it's her mother, but take the closest person in your life, the person that you trust and love more than anything. And now sincerely imagine that you cannot know whether when you were a child, they held your feet on a stove until they burned. Because that's the content of what she has this, this memory about. She cannot know whether that's true. She has the evidence. It's in sealed forensic bags in the California court district. It's just that the evidence doesn't decide it either way. It doesn't decide it for me. I don't know what to think about her case. It doesn't even affect me. It's not my mother, you know, but it still makes me crazy. And yet she still has to go home at, you know, 6 p.m. and work out whether it's her turn to get milk. You know, she still has to like walk the dog. 
she still has this testament to her, but I think also testament to the rest of us and what we're capable of, this utterly ordinary, love-filled, day-by-day type of existence, which is not, in fact, crushed under the burden of not knowing who she is, given that she has to change her mind about this. So I think, like, this, this whole book and project made me very optimistic in the end that we are much more capable of weathering things than we think. As to how we take it into account, this is a really interesting question, because there are, I mean, here's something that's just pragmatically true. If I want to help someone let go of a belief, and that belief is the only ballast holding up their sense of self, well, then I'm going to have to give them a couple other ballasts, right? So that when this one falls away, something else can be load-bearing. That's just pragmatically true. But then ethically, there's a different question, which is, well, to whom do I owe the ballast construction of a sense of self? There's very good evidence, for example, that like a lot of white supremacists who go on to join uh, like horrific groups will exit those groups once they have a sense of belonging from somewhere else in their life. That does not, to me, yield the conclusion that the way to fight white nationalism is with empathy, right? I want to be like very slow to come to that conclusion, and I want much more evidence than we currently have that that's going to work. So I think the, the problem that we're in kind of as people and also as a population is, well, pragmatically, we know that it's true that holding people's hand through this crisis of personality can be very effective. And yet, there are very good reasons to not want to owe people that and to think that it's not our job to hold up that person's sense of self. And whether this particular case you know, belongs in that pile or this pile is a question that uh, you know, only individual cases can answer, I fear. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, she's got the first. Well, and I was, oh, okay. Mine is a little bit less philosophical than that. But given that you and Elizabeth Warren have the same background in that she was a debater yeah. all through her career, her <laughs> high school and on, and she says that that's the one thing that gave her uh, direction in life. Yeah. Um, so, as given that you, your contention was that you have no power of persuasion after all that debate, do we then have to believe that Elizabeth can't change people's minds either? I mean, you know, um, I don't think so. So I think, I, I think actually, like it's kind of, the debating thing is tricky. Because I think that it sells you an anemic notion of what persuasion is. And there was a time in my life where I just like sucked as a human being because I kept in, like, imagining that personal debates were the same as stage debates. And I couldn't make room in personal interactions for just like softness and kindness and recognizing that like sometimes things are true and that's not a reason to say them. Um, <laughs> and I think it's like it's worth it when you're 17, this escapes you. Um, and yet it's also true that it's by far the most valuable thing that I ever did and that it trains you to kind of carve critical thinking in a way that nothing else trains you for. It makes you like lightning fast on your feet in a way that nothing else can, can do. Um, and I think it makes, you, it makes you perceptive about how the cogs of an argument are turning. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be able to fix them, but just being able to see the mechanics in a way that other people can't, I hope, I hope is an advantage. I don't know, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> I'm not at your nexus, but I'm fairly close, at least, on the political axis. Right. Uh, and my interest is in how to talk to the other side. Yeah. I, I'm nonpartisan, but that's where I do my thinking. Mm. In our debating in high school, uh, our judges are predictable. Mm. They, they have a procedural rhetoric. They've got criteria for scoring them. Mm. But when we're talking with someone else, if I'm going to talk to that lady or to that man, I have to, as the art of war says, I have to know my opponent. Yeah. So, so that's one factor. You're out there on the street for six weeks. Uh, how were you gauging your opponents? And I'm just going to just relate to a couple of other things quickly, if I may. Uh, what's your experience with recidivism? Mm -hmm. and that is, I can have a political discussion with someone uh, and they can leave the room and forget any change in their thinking that yeah. they had while they were with me mm -hmm. and start from their same base as before. Uh, th third thing is, uh, whether it's the person on the street or anybody with whom you're having a discussion, uh, you want to determine whether you want to win a debate, mm -hmm. which usually you don't need to do or don't want to do, or whether you want to nudge. Is it sufficient that yeah. they pick up a fact that they never had before? Yeah. Yeah. And finally, 
the saying is, we can proceed at the speed of trust. Uh, and that goes to your point yeah. that it's the person, not necessarily what mm. they are saying. Mm. Uh, now, let me, in addition to trust, add another word there, likability. Mm. Uh, and I'm not trying to be too personal here, but you're likable. You've got a nice <laughs> smile. Uh, you've got an accent that probably the group here finds fascinating. Uh, you know, people are going to say, hey, I want to listen to her before I want to listen to Tom. Uh, how much is that a factor? Right. Thank you for listening. Two, okay, so two things come to mind. The first thing about we can proceed at the pace of trust and about likability. The analysis that I give, the kind of philosophical analysis that I give of the catcalling phenomenon particularly, draws on work by, uh, they have a, it's a stupid label. They're called feminist epistemologists, which is too many syllables. Um, but they're basically scholars who in recent times have turned the question of failures of egalitarianism and failures of justice onto knowledge. So in other words, they look at the way that credibility is a good, right? Like the access to credibility is a social good. And just like any other social good, it is subject to warpings and failures of distribution in a way which maps onto how powerful people already are. So a kind of recurrent thing that happens in what we think of as just like rational debate, like we think that what happens in a rational, or we hope that what happens in a debate is that the words are the kind of swords and they will just clash away. And what you forget is that like some words, just like some people, arrive in debates pre-weakened by their opponents' perceptions of them. And there's this whole scheme of philosophical work that's being done at the moment called epistemic injustices, which basically just looks at the way that credibility inflates and deflates in a kind of similar way to like economic analyses of any distributive good, such that trust and likability wind up being precisely the currency that people most need to be persuasive, and yet also the thing that they can access least if they are the ones who are most in need of persuading other people, right? So that's the kind of thing that the powerless most need and yet cannot access. And it shouldn't surprise us that this happens with trust and likability and the ability to be believed, just like it happens for every other social good. Um, but the other thing about recidivism and the experience of people kind of losing what they gain inside any given conversation, it reminds me of, um, do, are people familiar with the Milgram experiments? The pamphlet version, if anyone's not, is that there was a series of psychological experiments done out of Yale um, just after World War II, which aimed to test the hypothesis that Germans were particularly like nationalistic or authoritarian as a people. And the structure of the experiment was to, broadly speaking, to, to give one participant an order to shock another participant with an electrical current. And the instructor of the experiment would order this shocker to turn up the voltage until the person that they were shocking appeared to be in horrific amount of pain. It turned out that the person being shocked was an actor, it was just like a, a tee up by the experiment. But the point that it aimed to illustrate was that people are capable of what they take to be enormous cruelty as long as they're being instructed to do it by someone with a white coat and a clipboard. And the reason I raise this is that actually if you go into the Yale archives and you look at the bits of paper, the other thing that they found in that experiment was that it doesn't take very much at all to drop levels of obedience radically. And the thing that it took to bring obedience down from like 98 to like 42, literally like that, was just the presence of someone else in the room. And the presence of someone who could serve for us as like a pair of eyes through which to see our actions. And the thing that brought compliance down even more was if that person said, I don't know if we should be doing this. Because that experience cracks some doubt into what otherwise might be a completely airtight cognitive environment. And the presence of someone else thinking the opposite to what you think can kind of vividify or like bring alive alternative belief options in a way which it might not be apparent now. You know, it might incubate for years. So William James um, is one of my favorite philosophers and he wrote a lot about, um, he wrote this book called The Varieties of Religious Experience which dealt a lot in like moments of sudden conversion. And he came to the belief that what appears to us to be a moment of sudden conversion has very often been the result of subconscious incubation for a very long time. And if we combine these two thoughts, then you know the optimistic hope is that by having conversations with people and by serving as the dissenting voice in the room, you can put something in their minds that will be 
a way of bringing another possibility to life. You know, it's, I mean, it's the day you plant the seed is not the day that you eat the fruit, you know. Question on the stairs. Hi, Eleanor. Thanks for showing up. Thank you. Uh, um, I <laughs> identify as a Buddhist, and um, one of the tenets of the Buddhism is uh, what you think you become, right? And also, to, and your reality is what's in your mind, so you mm -hmm. should question everything. Yeah. And I happen to think that uh, it would not be inappropriate to find your book in a Buddhist section. <laughs> so I guess my question for you is, do you identify with the Buddhist practice? Yeah, that's a really great question. I don't, but only because I'm lazy. Um, and I don't like to identify as anything because it requires too much commitment. Um, in fact, you know, it's the dictum to question everything is something that is really popular in many strains of analytic philosophy as well. And the dictum that you can't trust anyone kind of goes along with that. Or at any rate, that you shouldn't believe something just because you've been told it. I actually think that one of the things that the book does or one of the things that the story did for, the stories do for me is to make us realize like the cases where that's not true. Or the cases where out of love or out of faith or out of friendship, or just convenience, there are moments where it's totally appropriate to believe something without questioning it. And that I find deeply fascinating because there are plainly moments in life where that's not true. There are plainly moments where vast skepticism is warranted. And even to the point where you think that the way that you're experiencing the world just is what's in your mind. And yet also, after we've had that thought, so many of us just like get up and go to work and go talk to our spouses and go talk to our friends as though we weren't questioning everything. And trying to bring those kind of magnetic poles together when they resist each other so hard is in many ways the project of the book. It's like what this like overarching rational rule about like question everything, doubt everything. And yet, you know, I believe you that you're a Buddhist. I'm not doubting that. And you're not questioning me that I in fact spoke to these people and did these interviews. So what is it about this moment where we're in fact relinquishing our skepticism despite both thinking that broadly speaking it's a good idea to question everything? I don't know the answer, but, um, but it's, a, it's in many ways like the project to try to understand the limits of questioning anything, if indeed there are any. We have time for maybe one more question. Two more questions. Right here. Um, I'm curious about, uh, there's, there seems to be a dark current of kind of biological determinism right. um, that I'm... I'm probably not the only one, but seeing everywhere. Uh, so, sorry, say again. You probably what? Uh, probably not the only one, but right. seeing in a lot of different places, if it's behavioral economics or mm -hmm. if it's, I don't know, split brain experiments in psychology. It, it seems like there's the possibility that, you know, we're hopelessly, um, our narrative brain is hopelessly like rationalizing. Yeah. Um, you know, a kind of a runaway train. Yeah. And so the idea of convincing someone rationally, um, I don't know, almost seems impossible. Yeah. Uh, I know that is a large current of your book too, that it is more complicated than that. Yeah. But even further, you know, maybe um, convincing someone not to catcall, it's more important almost to convince them that um, social norms are so against that yeah. behavior yeah. that it is so that w it will hurt, yeah. <laughs> you know, for them to do so. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's almost not a conversation. It's more like a reality that they have yeah. to accept. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, I'm wondering where, I, where you think your work kind of falls within that. Yeah. Such a good question. So, it's such a banger list of questions. Um, so, the first is just an empirical thing, which is just like, is it the case that we are biologically determined and that a vast amount of what we believe and the way that we behave is given to us by our environment? Um, very complicated. As you know, there's persuasive evidence on either side. It doesn't look great. Uh, it's also very complicated to understand what that not great appearance in fact means. So David Vellman, who's a philosopher at NYU, who I really love, um, does a lot of work on the narrative self and on the creation of consciousness out of a mind. He has this great line about how peculiar it is to imagine that the rabbit could go solo and pull himself out of the hat. It's a really good line, right? Um, so I, like, I am agnostic about where the actual facts of selfhood and consciousness creation and biological, biological determinism leave us. What I think is that in that agnosticism, we are left with really important questions, namely, like, what are we meant to do? And one of the questions of the book is a question that I think it's very tempting to not want to engage in, namely, 
when do you just turn your spade? When do you just say enough is enough? And when do you regard someone's truculence or evidence resistance as a problem to be managed rather than a, a rational discussion to be had? I think very often we are tempted to believe the kind of model of liberal democratic discourse that we inherited from these like founders of democracy 300 years ago, which tells us that when people believe bad or noxious things, the way to correct that is with more and more open dialogue. And I think it is very worth our while to ask the question about whether that's true. I think there are obviously cases where it is. I think I've like corralled some of the more optimistic cases here, but I also think that there is absolutely a moment for recognizing where debate has hit its limits, not because we are so interesting and humane and complicated, but because we are so futile and stupid and stuck. And regrettably, that's true. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a pragmatic question about where each case falls on the spectrum, but I do like 100,000% think that there are very important questions that we need to ask ourselves like right now about when we are just wasting our effort. And also the footnote to that is if it turns out that we are just wasting our effort, then at least the kind of the good thing that we can pull out of that is like, it's not our fault. You know, I mean, I mean that quite sincerely because one thing that if you have this model, which is like, if you just talk to someone well enough, they'll come around to the truth. Well, then the fact that they keep not coming around to the truth is an indictment of you. It's a failure on your part to do your job and to reason with them effectively enough that they come around to the truth. And that can be agonizing. That can just make you become the vector of the problem. But once you let go of the conditional, right? Once you let go of the, if you reason with them, they'll see truth. Well, then it's no longer a referendum on you that they're failing to come to the truth. And that may be a kind of collective sigh of relief that we can have at some point. Final question. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll try to keep this as non-abstract as possible. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that was a great segue into one observation I had, which is throughout uh, our history as humanity, our different opinions have actually shaped who we are today. Mm -hmm. So the conflicts coming from different um, perspectives yeah. is part of our evolution of who we are. Yeah. So, so um, if you could share somewhat on your um, own thoughts on, on that, like maybe in a very strange organic sense, uh, this is just inevitably something that is part of our inheritance as, yeah. as, as a humanity. Um, and, uh, that's one thing. <laughs> and then uh, historically, um, do you think that the age in which we're in with social media and our way of communicating and interacting in social groups has somewhat altered our ability to yeah. be have our minds changed? So uh, we kind of sometimes it seems like everything is just a preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you mentioned about how there's evidence uh, that, hey, maybe this is wrong. Yeah. And then it makes people question. And sometimes you feel like there's millions of people saying, hey, this is wrong. And people yeah. are still doing it. Yeah, yeah. Are we oversaturated with uh, yeah. um, um, things to where factuality is is questioned then? Because I sometimes reflect on the the horrors of the past and you think about world war ii and it's yeah. like well people were so detached from the reality of what really war what's really going on yeah. out there they they're not exposed to it now yeah. in this day and age everybody knows exactly what's going on and yet yeah. they're still um um on board with it and then at uh, the same uh, uh then the last observation is that uh coming to the the preaching to the choir thing i think that uh people want to have their opinions reinforced like what they already yeah or they that really all they're listening to is what yeah. reinforces that yeah and anyth anything that's objectionable to it um it, it coming back to the sort of takes away their foundation they come back yeah. to the comfort of yeah uh, of, okay thank you do you know there's like there's there's literally evidence that uh that people so the way they structured this particular experiment was that they played people a broadcast of kind of just misc political stuff, let's say it was about eating meat or you know, pick any kind of blah position, played them speeches about that through a layer of static. And there is evidence that like at the level of auditory processing, the stuff that you process and the stuff that you hear is given to you by what you already believe. So people who had the belief that eating meat was right hear the parts of the speech that are about that. Which is at the level of like, literal auditory processing. Anyway, so okay, so let me take this in turn. Um, do I think it's part of our inheritance? Yeah, like, yes, obviously. Um, I was, in fact, I was in Edinburgh not too long ago for the International Book Festival, um, and I had this really weird moment that, because Australia is quite a, like, 
young country in terms of its history in like white colonized space, right? Like there's tens of thousands of years of history that we have, don't have records of, but in terms of just like history that's accessible to us with English records is quite young. So I didn't have the experience growing up of like having that much in the way of like legacy of stuff from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And I was in Edinburgh and I was like, oh, like all the wars between all the royal families this is like here, it's in the actual territory. It's in the way that we've carved up the literal space. Like the War of the Roses, its inheritance is now like I'm standing on, it just was this bizarre, it sounds like the kind of thought that you have when you're really high, but it just like struck me as really profound where I was like, my God, like history is now, <laughs> like it's all still happening. Um, and I think the same thing is true in the way that we carve up our intellectual space, right? Which is that so much of what we think now is obviously an inheritance from like the ways that these wars were fought previously, the way that propaganda was structured previously, the ways that like liberal media has been constructing messages, and, like all this stuff coalesces to give us this environment that is our inheritance. Do I think that the social media stuff is a problem? I think one of the things that is very difficult for us about this time is that we are simultaneously seeing something which is as old as history and something which we've never seen before. It's like we are familiar with the problems of propaganda. We are familiar with the problems of fascism. We are familiar with the problems of in-groups and violence and groupthink. These are not new problems. We have never seen them with this kind of kindling and this kind of kerosene. This is the first time that those very old phenomena have been, I was going to say subjected to, but like allowed to flourish in the environment of instant media. And I think that puts us in a really uncomfortable position, which is that like, we actually don't have the data about how these things work. The rate at which the good guys can discover how like, the dark net works and how like, phishing can work and how like, Russian bots can plant information on Facebook. Like, we barely even understand the phenomena, let alone how to fight them. But the kind of more interesting thing, or not more interesting, but an, an addendum to that is, I think, again, it calls on us to ask very serious questions about the limits of the way that we understand rational debate. Because the way that we structured our understanding of, if you and I have a debate in a political space in the town square, that's good and free and open and that's how we get to have a functioning democracy. That idea is from Athens thousands of years ago. And it's from revolutions that happened four and 300 years ago. It was not designed to weather an environment where there would be any motivation for saying something other than that you believed it. And yet now we find ourselves in an environment where so many people say stuff all the time because it's really lucrative. Like Rush Limbaugh has a net worth considerably larger than Beyonce's because he's managed to craft an astonishing brand that gets people coming back to, you put it really beautifully, the comfort of what they already feel. And the same thing, I mean, it's true on, on every possible side of politics. What you think and the things that you say is a brand and a way of making money as much as it is a contribution to like the honest exchange of truthful ideas in a democratic clash of ideas, you know? And in that environment, you have an incentive for saying stuff, which is purely economic. And that incentive didn't exist when we wrote the rules about how debate and liberal democracy should work. And that is particularly acute in social media where followers are currency and where people need like views through like a nasogastric tube it's particularly acute. And that I think is something that like, we have just collectively failed to acknowledge is that like, we are playing with an old rule book in a totally different game. Can we give another round of applause for Eleanor? Thank you.